My lord, I'm Fenimran KC, and I appear for the appellant. I'm instructed by Mitchell Mills LLP. My learned friend, Mr. Simon Porgadiri, is appearing for the respondent. He's instructed by Candy Solicitors. The interested party, that's the trustees of the pension scheme that we're all concerned with today, they are not represented and do not appear today. One very brief point of uh, bookkeeping. Do your lordships have a copy of the supplemental authorities bundle? It's a slim two authorities. It's it's broad idea. No, I don't. And, and nor do I. Okay, so that's a small problem. Um, I will be citing that quite early on in my submissions. Uh, it, effectively, that supplemental authority has Kyriva against. Uh, Benchamoff, which my Lord Justice Arnold identified for us. It's also got a copy of the broad idea of a convoy collateral limited against broad idea of international limited. I suspect your Lordships are very familiar with that case. Uh, it was sent down yesterday. Um, um, can I ask for two minutes to call my clerks to see about where those copies have got to? Because well, I'm, going I'm to sure your clerk will have lodged them. They, they, they have, have definitely have been. They got stuck in the system. Yes. Um, would there be an escape for asking your clerk to run off three copies of no, those exactly. cases? Exactly. Yes. If you give me five minutes, I can yes. sort that out. We'll rise for a moment. Great. Right.
Coming down? Yes. And I reckon we can get on with our outfit yes. and I can explain as things go on. Yep. So, today we have technically two applications. First of all, an application for permission to appeal, or an application to extend time for permission to appeal, and secondly, the appeal itself. Uh, the grounds for the application for extension of time are basically that our solicitor at the time was dying. And but I understand that's not opposed. And it's not opposed. I suspect that may only take us 30 seconds. Uh, and after that, we have appeal on three grounds. We've got the Senior Courts Act, 1981, Section 37.1, what I'm going to loosely, deliberately loosely, describe as a jurisdiction issue. Then we have ground two, public policy in relation to execution against a pension scheme post-bankruptcy. And then ground three, exercise of discretion in relation to this particular I'll very quickly take them in that order. For the tape, I suspect more than your lordships, it's, I will go through the application for permission to appeal out of time. I, I don't think you need to in circumstances where that is not opposed. It's not opposed, and it's quite clear that the reason was our, our solicitor was ill. Right. At some point, I will have to ask the order to tick boxes and We then move on to the issue of ground one in section 37. Um, this ground throws up a surprisingly difficult issue. The extent and nature of the jurisdiction under section 37 sub 1 of the Senior Courts Act 1981. Why is that a difficult issue? Why has the House of Lords not given us the answer in Fourier in the room? Um, when I say and, and when I say jurisdiction, I'm not saying in the strict sense of Fury and the Rue. I'm say, speaking in the soft sense. Uh, when we get Kai Reaver against Vegemoff to the court, there are two meanings. One strict, one more general. The first is in relation to the exercise, uh, whether or not somebody falls within the court's jurisdiction, whether or not the court can make an order against them. And undoubtedly, and we do not suggest otherwise, undoubtedly, the appellant falls within the jurisdiction of the court. The question is whether or not Section 37.1 jurisdiction should be exercised. Or to put it another way, this is a question of the scope of the jurisdiction. I will come back to Guy Reaver in a moment, but for example, if I can take your Lordship's the current authorities bundle, you can consolidate your authorities bundle, and it's the Cruise City against Unitec case of tab 13, where I think my Lord Justice Mayles was appearing at first, was deciding at first instance. That appears to be so. <laughs> and if your Lordships turn to, and it's PDF or page 200 of the bundle, paragraph 47 of the authority. Melodious Mayles highlights what he would summarise the position so far as relevant to the present application as follows. And this is an application for appointment of receiver. A, and I, I'm going to go through this in multiple times uh, in the next two hours, but A, 
the overriding consideration in determining the scope of the court's jurisdiction under Section 37.1 is the demands of justice. Those demands include the relation of the policy of English law that judgments of the English court and English arbitration awards should be complied with and, if necessary, enforced. I'm going to flag this because it's a substantial part of my submission. There's a distinction between you should comply with an order to pay money and, if necessary, the court should enforce that obligation. 47B, I have no doubt that this is accepted by everybody. The jurisdiction is not unfettered. It must be exercised in accordance with established principles, though it's capable of being developed incrementally. And this is, I wouldn't say first year law student stuff, but it's pretty obvious from all the authorities this is how it develops. It's not limited to situations where equity would appoint a receiver before the fusion of law and equity pursuant to the 1873 Judicature Act. That's very much a read back to Tazaroff and, and Masri. Specifically, in modern conditions where business is increasingly global in nature, the jurisdiction is unconstrained by rigid expressions of principle and responsive to the demands of justice in the community. And then C, this is the point I'm really highlighting at the moment, jurisdiction will not be exercised unless there's some hindrance uh, or difficulty in using the normal process of execution. Oh, there I'm highlighting that. Um, I'm highlighting that in the sense of, uh, I know, strictly speaking, I'm I actually... What, Paused. What I'm highlighting is 47. The overriding consideration in determining the scope of the court's jurisdiction is the demands of justice. That's what we're talking about in terms of jurisdiction in this case. It's a scope issue. So I fully accept. But, but I'm a little puzzled because the context of the observations of my Lord, now Lord Justice Wales, in this judgment is as one can see, appointment of a receiver. Yes. Um, hence all the references to execution. Whereas in the present case, as you yourself, in my view, entirely accurately say in paragraph 8 of your skeleton argument, what is being sought by the claimants are, quote, effectively injunctions. Yes. So why are we in the realm of receivers and execution? Why are we not in the realm of injunctions? We're in the realm of Section 37, which includes... Which simply recognises the pre-existing power of the Court of Chancery. Yes. And then you look to what the Court of Chancery can do, or, more specifically, what the Court today can do under Section 37. Well, it can do anything by way of injunction as regards someone who is subject to its jurisdiction. There has to be a principal basis for the yes. exercise of the jurisdiction, to be sure. Yes. But the uh, jurisdiction is unlimited. Jurisdiction is theoretically unlimited. It's fettered by application of principles of justice and what the court can do, the scope of a power. So the standard rules about the scope of a power, both statutory or private law, is the purpose of the jurisdiction. Appointment of receivers is peculiar because it has a long-standing historical background deriving from the courts of chancery as to why and how it will be applied. Not limiting it to pre-1873, but giving you an explanation of how it should be exercised. But the power to apply an injunction is not a simple, wide justice under a palm tree. We can do whatever we want to uh, obtain whatever result we want. It has to provide, we say, support for, assistance for, or protection of a legal or equitable right. Well, I would suggest to you that that's inaccurate, as one can see from the Cartier case, it's discussed in Kareva, where there was no legal or equitable right. On the contrary, the whole point of that case was that the defendants were innocent, so the, the respondents, the application for the injunction, were innocent of infringement. And, and yet, um, the Supreme Court said that ordinary principles of equity enabled the order to be made. Without the authority, 
bear with me for two minutes while I think about that. This is the website blocking. Correct. Right. Even within a website blocking case, you're still protecting somebody else's rights. And it's still got to be protecting at least the applicant's rights. Now, it may not be that the respondent to the injunction is the person who's infringing that, but the injunction is protecting the applicant's rights vis a vis somebody. Yes. It cannot be that the injunction is simply available without an attachment, without reference to somebody's rights. And we, I but why is the present injunction without reference to somebody's rights? Right. Because they have a judgment. Yes, okay, so that's what we're, that's the basis of our application. That's the basis of our appeal. In a nutshell, it's this. When you have a judgment debt, you have two rights. You've got the right to be paid, and you've got the right to enforcement if that payment is not The manner in which you can enforce is limited by the rules of court, various statutes that provide it. It is not simply you go to section 37 and say, well, this will trigger payment, because that would be a manner of enforcement. And the court's processes have delineated what manner of enforcement is available. I'll take your lordships to this, but it's CPR part 70 and the practice direction to CPR. There are situations where there is property that, for whatever reason, the normal manner of enforcement doesn't bite upon. And in those circumstances, the court has the available relief of the appointment of a receiver by way of equitable execution. Misnomer, I'll explain why. But that is specifically provided on the section 37 sub 1. But outside of that enforcement, as delineated by CPR Part 70, for alternative enforcement by means of appointment of receiver by way of equitable execution. The claimant, or depending on the claimant, I'm going to call it claimant for simplicity sake, the claimant does not have a right to attack the defendant's assets, rights, etc. Their rights entitlements have merged upon a judgment to simply be the judgment debt and the means of enforcement provided under the civil procedure. Now, I'd flag up, we are dealing with money judgments and by the time you're getting into judgments involving transfer of property it gets more complicated but it's still whatever is provided for under CPR. What has happened in this case is that we do not have a means of enforcement, nor do we have a situation where the appointment of a receiver by way of extra execution can assist or substitute for the means of enforcement. And as such, the claimant respondents do not have a right to attack the appellant defendant's assets or, or position is more accurate to put it. Because if they do so through section 37, what they're doing is generating a different form of enforcement than is provided for under the CPR. And that is outside the scope of section 37 because it would be circumventing, because A, it would be circumventing court procedural rules, and B, it would be giving a right that simply did not exist beforehand.
as I said before, this is a question of scope of jurisdiction, whether or not the jurisdiction should be and can be exercised by the Secretary of State. And I completely acknowledge my Lord Justice Arnold's point about this. In, in strict terms, we are subject to jurisdiction of the court, and Section 37 bites on us in, on an in personam basis. This is a question of whether or not Section 37 should be exercised properly. So, uh, on the grounds of appeal, we say there it is a subject, paragraph one, sub one, an impermissible extension of this court's jurisdiction. It might be clearer to put it as an impermissible extension of the exercise or scope of the court's jurisdiction. And the reference, the grounds of appeal at tab one, page 14 of the court bundle. Ground one, then judge erred in law and was wrong to hold. But it was a permissible exercise of jurisdiction under section 37 1 of the Senior Court Act to delegate the penalty power to revoke his enhanced protection in relation to his interest in the pension scheme to respond because one, the said power is neither property, an asset owned by the appellant, nor tantamount of ownership or equivalent to ownership of property, but rather a true power over property. As such, this was an impermissible extension of the, and to clarify, we say that this is sufficient for the purpose of the grounds. To clarify, we would say an impermissible extension of the exercise or scope of the court's jurisdiction. However, on any basis, if you go on to grounds one sub two, further on alternatively, if the power was not property, the learned judge's decision amounted to an exercise of the section 37 sub one power, not for the purposes of execution against asset or assistance in execution against a compulsion of action, which is not a remedy to which the rest of the rights were entitled. Now, just pausing briefly, this is focused simply on the power to revoke the enhanced protection? Yes, absolutely. Um, not on the lump sum, Blight and Brewster basic type order? No. So, what, why, if your argument that you're putting forward now is a good one, wouldn't it apply more generally? To, for example, the tax-free cash lump sum. Point. Yes. Right. I mean, if you say, well, um, if you look at the CPR, um, that tells you how you can enforce. Yeah. Um, Crude answer is, if you've got the ability to call for a tax-free cash lump sum, that's a power of appointment. It's it's not technically a general power of appointment, because the power of appointment has to be specifically to the person, the member. It's like a power of revocation is a form of a power of appointment, but only to the, per the set law. So just elaborating on how you fit it into your scheme. Yep. Um, you've got, in the, in the context of claiming the lump sum, uh, Tax-free cash lump sum, the power which already exists before any application of the court's orders, that is a power which is akin to or equivalent to property, and therefore on any basis, Hazaroff tells us, this is subject to an appointment of receivers. So, I mean, plainly, that's not in CPR. Part 70, that's no. section 37. It's not. And, and I emphasize you get enforcement by means of enforcement or appointment of receivers by way of ex execution. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and you very sensibly don't take issue with Mr. Moss's um, shortcut. Uh, no, absolutely. The crude answer is why bother arguing? Because instead of saying you can make an order and do it, and you, you appoint a receiver and get the end of it, so why would anybody anybody appeal it? Why would anybody argue about it? I suspect a more sophisticated answer is once you have the ability to appoint a receiver, you have a right, you have a legal right to a right that is being protected, or supported, or enforced by Section 37 itself. It's a bit odd. Section 37 
The first bit, injunctions, is supporting the second bit, appointment of receiver. Now, possibly, technically, you could argue that you should appoint a receiver and go through. What's the point? An equity acts in substance rather than form. So I suspect that the true answer to that is it works. Even if the true answer to that is it doesn't work, practical answer is, who cares, because you get it anyway. Yep. <clears throat> so, the point is this, once you've got a merged judgment, all your rights before judgment disappear. All you are left with is the entitlement to what the judgment gives you. Now, and I, again, I emphasize, we are talking about money judgment, so it's a nice, simple situation, but this applies in principle to judgments for the property, etc, etc. But because you've just got a money judgment, what you're entitled to do is payment of the money judgment. And if payment <coughs> does not, is not forthcoming, you have the right to enforcement. CPR Part 70. I suspect this court is very familiar with it. I will briefly take your lordships to it. But CPR Part 70, basically the enforcement mechanisms are provided under statute and CPR. And I will be coming back to this point. In certain circumstances, there are property, there is property, there are properties, which are not prima facie or easily amenable to execution or enforcement in the ordinary sense. And historically, prior to the Judicature Act and preserved and continued under the Senior Courts Act, the courts provide relief by way of an or equitable relief where the legal forms of enforcement are not available. Originally legal forms of enforcement, I would, I would say now forms of enforcement are not available. And that's why you appoint a receiver by way of equitable execution. I will come back to this point. The term is a misnomer. Ec receiver by way of equitable execution is wrong if you pass it PII pass it. It's not execution. It's a relief that is a substitution for execution. But what it's doing is it's saying there is property against which ex execution, now the modern term for enforcement, is not available, so equity will provide relief as a substitute. But whilst equity will provide relief by way of substitute for enforcement against property, that is its limit. It will not compel people to change assets into something that enforcement could be made or into property that a relief could be granted. Now, coming back to my Lord Justice Arnold's point mm -hmm. about strict jurisdiction, you can make these orders against people versus what we say soft jurisdiction, it's scope of jurisdiction issue. You look at Section 37 and the question of in what circumstances and why would the court be exercised it comes down to, we would say, the purpose of Section 37. And the purpose of Section 37 cannot be anything other than to support the court's processes, assist, support, aid the court's processes. Well, more fundamentally, it goes back to why we have the jurisdiction of the courts of equity in the first place, because all of this pre-existed prior to the judicature acts, as you rightly acknowledged. And the whole point is, as we all know, the courts of equity stepped in where the law failed. Yes. Um, they, in particular, provided remedies which were unknown to the common law. Yes. Most notably, the remedy of an injunction. Yes. Absolutely. But just because the court of common law did not have a remedy did not mean that the court of equity did. And the Court of Equity's jurisdiction, prior to 1873 and right through, including Tazarus to the present day, is limited in how it will be exercised. And in particular, it will only be exercised where there is property, we say, and I will take you also through the authority, we say, it will only be exercised where there is property which the normal forms, or what used to be described as a legal enforcement, are not available. So if I take your lordships to for example, the decision in Cruise City 1, Mauritius Holdings, 
authority bundle tab 13. <coughs> Paragraph 47, this is PDF page 200. Paragraph 47. My Lord, Mr. Justice Mayles, as he then was, sets out, uh, summarizes the position so far as relevant to present application. And this is in the context of appointment of receiver, but. Yeah, well, you took us through this before. Yes. And sub C, the jurisdiction will not be exercised unless there is some hindrance or difficulty in using the normal process of execution, but there are no rigid rules as to the nature or the hindrance or difficulty required, which may be practical or legal, and it's necessary to take account of all the circumstances of the case. Yeah. Now, so, so, why is that condition not fulfilled in the present case? because it's common ground that the normal process of execution, in particular by a third-party debt order, is not available. Yes, and the problem is not that there's no property for when you appoint a receiver, it's that the property is not subject to the execution or enforcement. The difficulty arises where there's no property at all against which enforcement or the appointment of a receiver by way of execution can fight. In a nutshell, this is why Tazareth was argued. If the question was simply, can you enforce through the normal means of execution? No, fine, we'll appoint a receiver. Then the question in Tazareth of, is this property in the, or does equity treat this as property, would be irrelevant. Just getting off the tangent for a moment. The, um I'm forgetting the terminology. On any view, your client has a contingent right to claim um, whatever it is you. Uh, L A E L S. Life. Uh, yes. Lifetime allowance, excess lump sum. Yes. He has a contingent right to claim that. Well, uh, you can describe it as a contingent right. He has to jump through certain hoops before he gets that right. But yes, that's a contingent right, I suppose. You can appoint a receiver in respect to the contingent right. No. It, why not? It's a right. Because it. Because it's not property. If, if the right to claim the ordinary lump sum is property, and you accept it is, why isn't the contingent right to claim right. the larger lump sum property? Because equity treats as property a power to grab property directly. I'm going to be coming back to this. But the crude point is this. Powers are not property in the strict sense of the word. And you can see this because if I own this book, Volume 2 of the White Book, that's property. And somebody can enforce against that book by what used to be called a writ of fee far, now is called a writ of control. If I have a power to hand that book out to people, that's not property, it's not a physical thing. It's not even a shows in action. It's, the, it's an ability, it's a, it is literally a power. And going right back to the basics, that is not property in strict sense of law. Equity, when appointing a receiver by way of execution, says, right, we look to substance rather than form, and where this is akin to or equivalent to actual property, good enough, then we will say, yes, this is property for the purposes of appointment of receiver. I don't know whether that's a good analogy, but uh, uh, a power to give something away is not really comparable with a revocation of enhanced protection in order money and anyway the court will restrain a power to give something away by making a freezing order. Breaking that down. The first part is basically the answer to our appeal. A power to revoke life uh, enhanced protection is not property. The court will prevent exercise of a power to diminish the value of property under a freezing injunction. Because what it is doing is protecting the right of the claimant to enforcement. If there's property already there that can be enforced against, the court will protect under Section 37 the diminishment of that right. But if there isn't property against which enforcement can be made, the court will not protect a non-existent right. So when your lordship says you can't describe a power to revoke well, I'm really questioning property. whether your um, example of a power to give a book away is a right. relevant so, analogy, really. Yeah, okay, it, it was a stretch. Um, loaning the book, 
is that a power of, that's akin to property or allowing people to use it is that akin to, akin to property probably not if I can distribute the book if I can give this to my learned friend title etc that's pretty close to property that is a power of appointment powers of and, and this is something that's going to come up in the next hour or so powers of appointment the ability to hand over property are in certain circumstances very close to ownership but this power to revoke enhanced protection isn't a power to hand over property. That's why it's not akin to property. Let's leave that specific right on one side for a moment. You have a set of rights as against the pension scheme. Yes. Why can't a receiver be appointed in respect of that set of rights? They can. Like and then, uh, once a receiver has been appointed in respect of all your rights against the pension scheme, why is it ah, possible or, to, or, hang on. Why is it not possible then to grant an injunction requiring uh, your client to uh, write to the revenue revoking his enhanced protection so okay. that the right in respect of which there is already a receiver becomes more valuable? Right. You can appoint a receiver in respect of your rights that are akin to property in relation to the pension scheme. You can't appoint a receiver in respect of other rights that are not akin to property. Well, where is there a... A distinction. You have a set of rights, a collection of rights against the pension scheme. Yes. Uh, they include all ways in which you could get money out of the pension scheme. Currently. Why currently? I mean, uh, take a remote example. Um, I have uh, a contingent interest depending on the death of somebody or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't currently have any right to enjoy that. Um, but it's perfectly yeah. Well it's a future right. As, um, uh, yeah, and so we've we've identified in Tazara if you can do it, you can appoint a receiver over a future right, and it's been well ex well established. And not merely a future right, but a contingent right. Contingent right, yes. But you're not doing anything to trigger it. No, no, no of itself, no. But you appoint the receiver over all the rights against the pension scheme, and then you just say, well, okay, you can have an injunction against the individual mm -hmm. to make the right. Uh, and uh, that's the bit. You can't make somebody exercise these rights in a different way. So the receiver is a receiver of property. Absolutely. Right. You can't appoint a receiver over something that's not property, including that which equity treats as property. And I'm not appointing a receiver over the right to uh, right to the revenue. I'm appointing a receiver over the rights against the pension scheme. Yes. And then I'm granting an injunction right. against your client. And you in order can't to make appoint, it you can't make an injunction against somebody to generate a right that wasn't there in the first place because injunctions section 37 injunction is there to support the court's processes and to support and protect the party's rights I would merely be granting the injunction to uh, uh, make more effective the appointment of the receiver that had already been made in relation to all the rights against the pension scheme sorry could you I blanked for a second. I, I, I wouldn't be appointing a receiver in respect to the right to right to the revenue. I would be appointing the receiver in respect of all the rights against the pension scheme. Yes. And then I would be requiring you to write to the revenue um, to uh, as ancillary to, to, to the right. receivership which would exist. Why would you be exercising the Section 37 jurisdiction to make me write to the revenue? And that's the scope issue. And the, the, uh, the reason for the exercise of the Section 37 in those circumstances would not be for the aid or assistance of enforcement, because you don't have a right to enforcement at the moment because it doesn't exist. And it wouldn't be for the aid or assistance of a point or receiver. The receiver's already appointed. It would be to help the receiver once he had been appointed. No. The receiver can do what the receiver is entitled to do. Already done. Already appointed. Doesn't need assistance. What you're doing is changing what the receiver receives. That's merely a way of accessing a particular right in respect ah, to the... But the right doesn't exist until you've accessed it. No, he, he's already got all the rights against the pension scheme, including yes. the contingent right to... Uh, but, you don't tr but the right to trigger the contingent right has not been exercised. There are... Section 37 is supposed... The injunction is supposed to protect legal or equitable rights that exist. And by the time you have a judgment debt, that legal or equitable right is execution or enforcement in the modern terms. 
And if you don't have property that the enforcement can bite against, you have the equitable receiver, or receiver by way of execution, right. But if you have something that doesn't fall under either of those auspices, you don't have a right. And the legislature through the years has limited what the court can do. It's excluded imprisonment of debtors. It's limited what you can do under a FIFA writ, or now writ of control. It has uh, provided express provision for what you can do under a charging order or under an income payment order. But those are expressly limited to what you can do by way of enforcement. If you don't have an asset which can be enforced against, you don't get an injunction to affect the X that you're worried about. You can see that all the way back in Camdex. And I'm going to take you through this. It, it keeps on coming up. So Camdex, authorities tab 9. So whenever I come to an authority, I tend to just give a little factual summary of the case. This was a vulture fact that had a post-judgment debt. And the Vulture Fund was going against the Bank of Zambia debts. And it sought to obtain a Moraver injunction over bank notes that had been printed but not issued. So Zambia, the country of Zambia, printed its bank notes using a printer in the UK. And these are unissued, so technically worthless bank notes. I think 19, literally 19 tons technically worthless, and on the open market had no material value, because nobody would buy unissued banknotes, it was paper. On the other hand, Zambia, if they couldn't get their hands on these banknotes, was, to use a common term, stuck. So, the question was, can you get a freezing injunction over these banknotes post-judgment? Section 37, sub 1, absolute classic situation. And the answer was, because this is not preserving property which you could enforce against, it was an inexcusable application of Section 37.1. And you can see this in two situations. First, I'm going to take you to page 639 of PDF page 74. Lord Justice Phillips, as he then was, describing why a Moravian injunction grasped after judgment is a comparatively rare form of such relief. By his Deutsche Schadbaubund, a Moravian innovation, the time is shown to be one of the most imaginative enforcements and on the whole, the most beneficent of one time, laying, giving a plaintiff some degree of protection before he became a judgment creditor and anticipation that he would become one. Judgment creditors had little need of new protection because they were usually adequately protected by their right to levy execution by a writ of FIFA, which is control now, attachment of debts, third party debt order, or, or the appointment of a receiver. Lord Justice Phillips goes on, a Moravia can properly be granted after judgment in circumstances which must be rare, where this is necessary to prevent the removal or dissipation of an asset before the process of <coughs> execution can realise the value of that asset for the benefit of the judgment creditor. It explains in this case that's not the case. And in but, this but, but the reason why it wasn't the case was that there was no value. Ah. As, as, as is explained down the foot of the page, um, these banknotes had no market value whatsoever. They were worthless and potentially embarrassing quantity of scrap paper of some 19 yes. tons in weight. So it wouldn't be something you can execute against. Because it had no value. Yes, but it also, it would have had impact because Zambia would have been pressed to deal with. Yes, so there's no benefit to the judgment creditor because this paper has no value and there's a great detriment to the... Def no, there's so clearly a benefit to the judgment creditor because they can press Zambia to pay up. If you but this, go was, back this was simply um, exerting commercial pressure on Zambia. Yes. The, the analogy with this case would be if uh, the claimant had sought an order that Zambia should issue the banknotes so that they became money against which it could enforce. I mean, there are all yeah. sorts of reasons why the court could have said no to that, but yeah, that, that issue simply didn't arise. Well, exactly, but it, it wouldn't have ordered that because it's creating something, it's pushing an action which was not in, they were not entitled to under execution. And it, they're quite clear about this. At page 636, where Sir Thomas Bingham MR is giving his judgment, 
636, the bottom page H. <coughs> Paragraph, it seems to me the situation such as this is important to go back to first principle. A Miranda injunction is granted to prevent the dissipation of assets by a prospective judgment debtor or a judgment debtor with the object or effect of denying a claimant or judgment credit satisfaction of his claim or judgment debt. Now, here it's plain that the defendant wants to transfer these banknotes to Zambia. In doing so, it would not, it seems to me, dissipate any asset available to satisfy the judgment debt because the asset has in the open market value, in the open market, no value. Not an asset of value to the plaintiff or other creditors of the defendant if it were put up on the market and sold. Through the denial of the asset, the defendant would put the defendant in a position of such extreme difficulty that the defendant would seek to pay a price beyond the market value of the asset in order to recover it. And that is, as it would seem to me, what would in ordinary parts be described as holding someone's ransom. So you can't use Section 37 simply to produce payment of a judgment debt. Well, you can't use it to hold someone to ransom, but is it your submission that that's the effect of the judge's order in this case? Yes. Well, not of someone to ransom, but it is that it produces payment where there is no right to payment. The defendant has a right to revoke enhanced protection, which is a right which has value. I appreciate it um, involves a tax hit, but it also releases money, and it may be in some circumstances that somebody in dire need of money would uh, choose to do that and take the tax hit. Why, is, why, why, isn't, why, isn't that a, why isn't that a right? Well, it ena ena enables um, uh, a further payment to be made. It enables a further action to be taken that enables a further payment. Why isn't, that, why isn't that akin to property? Right. You can either exercise the starting it or not so in, or, in order to get money which you wouldn't right. otherwise get. Akin to what property? The money that comes out at the end? Because if I have a right to demand that somebody hands me over this book of post-it notes, then I've got something that's akin to property in the post-it notes. But if I have to pay before they hand over the post-it notes, I don't own those post-it notes. I've got a right to purchase. That's not property. That's a different type of right. In this particular case, <coughs> if you remove the lifetime, the enhanced protection, it doesn't just give rights to the ability to call for the lifetime allowance excess lump sum. What it does is it changes what you were entitled to generally. So instead of being entitled to a 25% tax-free cash lump sum by reference to 1.5 million pounds, which is the lifetime allowance in 2006, it shifts to a 25% tax-free cash lump sum by reference to the current lifetime allowance, 1,073,100. And if we thereafter take action to take a, to grant, to obtain 2016 in protection, it goes from 1,073,100 to 1,250, but still not 1.5 million. So instead of simply saying, if you remove the enhanced protection, you get another right. If you remove the enhanced protection, you lose certain rights. You change what you are beneficially entitled to. This is not a power of appointment. And a power of appointment is the ability to grant or distribute assets. This does not do it. It changes what a beneficiary is entitled to. If this was an amendment to a pension scheme, it would probably be prohibited under Section 67 of the Pensions Act 1985. It's not a distribution of property. It's not ancillary to a pure distribution of property. It literally changes what can be obtained. It goes from, we are entitled to, raw figures, £350,000 tax-free lump sum, to £325,000 tax-free lump sum, or even if you don't take a, a assistance of the 2016 protection, 312,000 tax-free lump sum. It changes what somebody is entitled to. Now, at its heart, this case is about whether or not the court will exercise
exercise Section 37 to make people change what their property rights are in order to assist creditors, judgment creditors, in obtaining payment. And we say that the jurisdiction, the, the scope of the jurisdiction to do that is delineated by what you can do by way of enforcement, including appointed receivers by way of because if you go further than that, the exercise of Section 37 is not assistance or aid of, sec or of enforcement. It is changing people, is making people change their property rights. Now, leaving aside Article 1 of First Protocol, this is not a human rights point, this is simply a Section 37 issue. Is this within the scope of Section 37? Now, I, I fully accept. The court has a principle, which is that debts should be paid. And the court has a principle, or a practical application, that fraudsters should be carefully watched to make sure they don't avoid enforcement. But it's not that fraudsters should have a different set of remedies against them. It's simply that the remedies should be applied carefully. Can I just explore that a moment longer? Um, leave enhanced protection out. Yep. You have a pension scheme uh, under which uh, somebody can choose to opt for a lump sum or he can just uh, take a, an annual pension. Yep. Um, you don't, as I understand it, dispute that a receiver could be appointed in respect of those sorts of rights. The pre existing right to call for a lump sum, you can appoint a receiver over. Absolutely. Well, he, he can be, the receiver can be appointed over both, can't he? He can be appointed over the right to take the... Uh, Lump sum and the right to take an issue. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. We agree with that. And he can then choose which... Yes. Or both. Or both. Uh, and therefore, he is changing the uh, debtor's rights. No, he's exercising. Well, he's... he's exercising the rights. Uh, I'm, the that fact that the consequence... Terminological point. No, it's not a terminological point. The fact that on the exercise of the rights, things happen doesn't change the fact that those rights exist already. Well, he has a right to trigger certain things, but yes. when he exercises the right to take the lump sum, he is diminishing the right to get an annual pension. Yes, but the right to take a lump sum is treated in equity as property. That's, That's why the receiver can do it. But, but if you put forward a general principle, which I'm not sure you are doing, but if you were to put forward a general principle that a receiver... Uh, or an order is inappropriate because it changes somebody's rights, well, that can't be right, can it? Because no. it's plainly possible for a receivership to be appointed, uh, to, to be um, uh, institu instituted on the basis that the receiver can then no, do, the receiver do can things be appointed. which will alter the rights. Right, so the receiver can be appointed over property. And the property can include a particular, can include a particular right to call upon property. And if the right to call upon property is akin to property, that's why the receiver can be appointed over it. And that's why the receiver can be appointed over appoint power of appointment or its subset, power of revocation. And that's what the limit of when you can appoint a receiver over power. But I, I can't see this bright dividing line at the moment. I mean, you, you can appoint a receiver in circumstances where the receiver can choose, which are two existing rights to exercise. Yes, but, it, but you can appoint where a receiver is out as a result of that. You can appoint a receiver in circumstances where no right has yet arisen, but it is going to arise. Again, future future entitlements. Yes. Uh, you can appoint a receiver where uh, it's uncertain whether the right is going to arise, but um, uh, he can be appointed in respect of the contingent right. Yes. Yes, so long as so long as the contingency arises, yes. Uh, or appointed well, over it, appointed and, now, and appointed yes. over it, and then if the contingency arises, they can exercise it. Yep. Um, plainly, it would be possible to appoint a receiver in respect of the uh, right to uh, claim the, the the larger lump sum were your client right to the revenue. Yep. In revoking his enhanced protection. Yep. But you can't make him do it. Well, that's a different point, isn't it? You can have the receivership over all these rights. Yeah. The question then is, can you grant an injunction to require
require him to write to the revenue. Or, that, that, equivalently, he, appoint a receiver to exercise that right. Yes, at the moment I'm looking at it not in those terms, but in terms that you've got the receivership over all the rights. All you have to do is grant an injunction to make ancillary payment. to the receivership over the... Yeah. But the receivership is only about what is property. Uh, and until... The unti by no, until the contingency has been exercised. It's not property. Well, in that case, you couldn't appoint the receiver over the contingent right. But I think no, you, you can. A you can, but you can appoint the receiver over whatever comes out of the contingent right. But he's appointed in respect of the rights, whether or not they turn out to eventuate. Yes, but you're not appointed so as to generate those. Well, that's a different point. The question is, can you appoint a receiver in respect of the contingent right to receive the enhanced be benefits? I can't yes. see any problem. Yes, but uh, what, you're, what your lordship is saying, is I can appoint a receiver to receive the contingent, contingently distributable right. And then I can trigger the contingent right by means of an injunction. But that's assuming that the receivership is generating the contingent right. It's not. It's only catching what comes out of it. The, the receivership is catching the contingent right. Yes, then it's but a question it, of whether you can grant an injunction in aid of the receivership. No. Trigger the right. No, and that's the point. Triggering the right is not in aid of the receivership. The receive trigger what an injunction could assist in making sure that what comes out of an exercise of a contingency makes its way to the receiver. So you could freeze out the bank accounts, etc., and make sure that it doesn't get dissipated. But if you only have the right to whatever comes out of it, but not the right to trigger it under receivership. Your assistance of the receivership stops at catching what comes out of it. It doesn't go so far as triggering the receivership. Because until that, re that, that contingency has been triggered, you don't have a right to it. It's not property. So you can't do anything by way of order against the uh, debtor that would make the receivership effective. No, that's not what I'm saying. You can do lots of things to make the receivership effective. The receivership is absolutely effective against whatever comes out of that. But the receivership doesn't trigger it. What your lordship is confusing is, if there is a contingency, you, might, you make sure that the money goes into the receivership. And that's all the receivership does. Compared to making things get triggered to come into the receivership. You don't need to assist that. It's not part of the receivership. You're not entitled to it. You're not entitled to assistance to generate it. Because until it's been triggered, it's not property over which the receiver can be appointed. Because the receiver can only be appointed over property which is not amenable to the normal execution. And until there is property, or treated in equity as property, you don't get to appoint a receiver. Could you um, take a... I can't quite work out how the facts would work, but suppose um, you, you've got a receiver, a receiver appointed in respect to the contingent right, and the uh, debtor then can be seen to be intending to do something that will destroy the right. Can the receiver get an injunction to stop them doing that? You could definitely get an injunction to stop the destruction of a potential right. Because that is what freezing injunctions often do. So, can I take you to... So, I've seen Camdex. Take your lordships to Holyoke and Candy, which is authorities tab 16. It's just as new to you as it then was. Paragraph 8, which is at page 363, PDF page 244. 
this affected by the Court of Appeal decision in that case? Uh, not this particular section. Right. This is just a general description of powers uh, of the Court in relation to Section 37 and the particular freezing injunctions I'll show. So, uh, Mr. Justin Yuji says in paragraph 8, rather discuss all the authority put for me in turn, I propose to state my own understanding of the principles of which Well, Although Section 37 is broad in its terms, it's fallacious to say it's completely unfettered. In this instance, it's a black letter of the law. Established soon after the Dickature Act from Ben Browning. Well, you say that, but of course, he doesn't take into account Bory and LaRue, which wasn't cited. I see that. Um, but this is and the, and, and you know, the whole point about Forley and LaRue is it explodes the fallacy which underlaid Dowie and Brownrigg. Well, yes, but in terms of how you ex exercise Section 37 power, it's it's describing whether it should be just as well as convenient. It goes on to say what well, well, just them are meant by that was court could not grant an injunction whenever it seemed convenient, but only in accordance with legal principles, which I don't think is a, a a disputed fact. In that case, the plaintiff complained of the defendant who lived in a house formerly called Ashwood Villa, recently changed the name to Ashwood Lodge. Neighbours who had that name claimed injunction. Vice Chancellor Malins had refused to tomorrow brought by the defendant, but the Court of Appeal allowed them, holding that there was no legal right to the exclusive use for a name of a house, and that such right is not known in law. And it was in that context that Lord Justice James added the postscript, this is page 307. I think it right to add that the power given to the court by section 25A of the Judicature Act, 1873, key first paragraph. The grant injunction in all cases in which it shall appear to the court to be just convenient to do so does not in the least alter the principles on which the court should act. It goes on to say it doesn't follow that there may have been a point on the court, the court's power under what is now section 37 is limited to granting relief where it could have been granted since 1873, and that's Mazarin. There had been this difficulty that a Moravia injunction could be granted. And it carries on to say, but it does not follow that the jurisdiction under section 37 is completely unfettered. Lord Justice Coyne said it, it does not mean Section 37 one should be taken as conferring an unfettered power, and this is the scope issue. The power of 180 referring to Parker Villa for Hester Camden, Brown Walkers and LG agreed jurisdiction under Section 37 to appoint a receiver was unlimited, but this decision is not a source of a pure source of authority since I doubt whether these dicks can stand up you know, pee against the principles they post. A similar statement is the saying of Chief Justice Kennedy. Uh, the same one was repeated in uh, Tazara. Sub two, this judgment is not the place to examine the precise limits of Section 37 power, something that, as appears from the case referred to in Masri, is not yet settled by the Supreme Court. Therefore, what can be said is that in normal circumstances, what is needed to persuade the court to grant an injunction is a threat to do an act which constitutes an invasion of a legal or yeah, equitable right. We know that's wrong, as Cartier demonstrates. There was no threat by the respondents in that case to invade any, do any act constituting an invasion of a legal or equitable rights. On the contrary, they were simply allowing their customers to do what their customers were contractually entitled to do. I have to confess, my lord, I'm going to have to go away and read Cartier to analyse them. I will do so. I have a short agenda. But, in principle, on what basis could the court exercise Section 37 to support something that is not a right. It is not someone's right or property. Because on what basis could the Senior Courts Act grant the power to the court to support somebody in doing something they don't have a right to do? That would be a bizarre, I would say, impossible interpretation of the Senior Courts Act. There must be something, somewhere, protecting a right. Not necessarily against Cartier's clients, but against the claimant's right. Something somewhere must be being protected. It can't be a simple, we don't like you, we're going to do this. Cartier must have had a judgment, a reasoning, as to what they were protecting and why they were exercising Section 37. So the basis of it was that the claimant's rights were being infringed by third parties and the respondents were in a position to do something to stop it. Right. So at least you've got a right which is being protected. Not as against the respondent. Yes, but it's still a right that's being protected. The respondents had the power. This is why 
it's, I bring it up as against your continual reference to power. Because what respondents in that case was they had the power to do something yes. which would stop or at least reduce the scale of infringement. Okay. I, I, but to I do am... that, they had to break their contracts with their own customers, and the court was forcing them to do that. Right. But it's still in assistance of a right to a, of the claimant to protect their particular right. Well, in the present case, there's a very clear legal right, isn't there, which is the right to have the judgment deck paid. Yes, and, but and only... And the enhanced protection or revocation of enhanced protection is something which will help to vindicate that right. Yes, but the right the to have the payment made. Well, just let me finish. It means that the judgment creditors will get more money than if the enhanced protection remains. Yes. But insofar as the payment has not been made, the court rules have identified in what, and indeed the senior courts have identified in what way the court can assist, namely enforcement, CPR Part 70, appointment of receiver by way of execution, CPR Part 69, but also Section 37. If you go outside of that, you're going outside of what is permitted. Well, you're not, you're not going outside vindication of legal rights, which is the point you were on. But you are going outside of vindication of legal rights, because you have two rights. You have the right to be paid, but you have the right, if not paid, to enforce. And if you are not paid, and there are limited rights of enforcement, these are the ways in which you can enforce a debt that has not been paid. If at that, that right? stage that's you are going beyond that, then Section 37 is being used to circumvent limitations on what you can do to enforce. Well, doesn't that beg the question? You're reading into Section 37, you can appoint a receiver, but only for the purpose of um, enforcing rights available to you under CPR 70. You can appoint a receiver by means of uh, equitable execution, by means of relief, which is a substitution for strict enforcement. But that's the point of Section 37. It says you can appoint a receiver. And then the courts in Tazarov, etc., say in what circumstances you can appoint a receiver. Look, if this case stands, what you get is an, ex is an execution of a power, not property power to revoke enhanced protection. And that changes what my client is entitled to. It doesn't just make available a larger lump sum. It changes what my client is entitled to. So to give you the basic and unarguable point, without enhanced protection being revoked, he's entitled to a 25% lump tax-free cash lump sum calculated by reference to a 1.5 if you revoke enhanced protection, it's 25% tax-free cash lump sum by reference to the current lifetime allowance, which is $1,070,000. And even if my client exercises his ability to take 2016 protection, it's still $1.25 million. So he's changed what he is entitled to. He has changed. It's not just, oh, this property is now available to the, to the claimant. It is my client's assets have changed. And yes, it makes available more money to the claimant. But it changes what my client has. Now, if your lordships carry on with the first instance decision and say this is acceptable exercise of Section 37, your lordships are saying that the court can mandate debtors changing their property rights simply on the basis that it generates more money to pay a creditor. And it's not only applicable where somebody is a fraudster. Fraudsters don't, claimants against fraudsters don't have any different remedies. They just have the court being careful about the application of the remedy. It's not a penalty. There may be criminal sanctions, but in civil law, there is no penalty of subject to the question of causation. But once you've got the judgment, that's it. You're entitled to your money. And the fact that we're, uh, the, the, the respondent is a, the defendant is a fraudster only makes a question of practical difference, not what they're entitled to in 
principle. So if your Lord Ships approve of this, it is a hard case to make bad law. Because in principle, Section 37 could make you go out and write a book. Record an album. Sing a song. That's a power, but it would generate property that could be enforced against you. Why not? Why not make them go and work? Why not make them pay the money that's necessary to enforce an option? And that is beyond what is capable under Section 37, the scope of Section 37, because Section 37 is not about expanding the remedies available to people in enforcement. It is supporting the remedies available in enforcement against property. Either it's subject to property enforcement under section part 70 or it's property that isn't remediable or realisable under part 70 and you appoint a receiver to circumvent those difficulties but it's still a question of whether or not there's property that can be enforced against because if I'm wrong about that if you can do whatever you like to just trigger or generate some sort of property what is the point of the entire case of Tazara? All the questions as to whether or not this power was akin to property would be irrelevant. They could have simply said, Section 37 simply assists in enforcement. It's going to generate a property that can be enforced against that or this. They could have said, we don't even need to appoint a receiver. We'll just, we'll just do an order that you trigger the, trigger the right of revocation. And Tazaroff was a power of revocation. It would result in money coming back to settle, which would undoubtedly have been enforceable against under normal enforcement procedures. The reason that Tazaroff was so concerned about whether or not this was property was because if it wasn't property, then the claimant didn't have a right to enforce against it. Enforcement is against property. It's not, a, it's not about making people do things. We have moved on several centuries from the days of indentured servitude. Because why not? Now, this is not, and there is one thing I, I would highlight. This is not a floodgates argument in terms of if your lordships grant this appeal. Because most pensions do not have enhanced protection. Most pensioners do not have enhanced protection, number one. So all this argument is highly hypothetical. Number two. Most pensions already provide the ability to call for the entire pension in a, as, as a lump sum subject to tax. It's the pension's freedom after 2006. Did I make it? 2010-11, yeah. So most pensions now, now allow you to take all your pension sums, or most personal pensions, allow you to take all your personal pension subject to a massive charge of tax. This is a peculiar case. The Richard Green pension scheme didn't get updated to allow that. It's why they had to, it, but it, it already allowed the potential for a lifetime allowance excess lump sum. It's why the claimants in this case had to go through the revoking enhanced protection to get them access to this power. In most pension schemes, you can just grab everything anyway, whether or not you've got enhanced protection or otherwise. So the impact of this in terms of people protecting pensions is pretty darn limited. The impact of this in terms of protecting people in terms of the impact of Section 37, when you can order injunctions, for what purpose can you order injunctions, is massive. In general, a Section 37 injunction should protect an existing legal or equitable right, however distinct, diverse, distant that right is, there must be something that is being protected. And if you don't have a right to enforcement over this property, you don't have a right to protect, enhance, assist. So, in Cartier, and I will go away and look, at, look this up over the short of German, in Cartier... It's, it's, it's not just Cartier, I mean, we've also got the decision of the uh, Privy Council in the Convoy Collateral and Broad Idea case, um, and they discuss Cartier at paragraphs 50 and 51 and the following. Um, and the question
question of a legal or actual right of paragraphs 52 and following. Um, and uh, the conclusion reached is you don't need a legal or an equitable right. Um, and they endorse Dr. Spry's summary in his book about uh, the extent of the power to grant injunctions being unlimited. Yes, but even in broad idea, they highlight the enforcement principle, which is that the purpose of this is to protect the ability to enforce against something. And that's what, the, the, that's what is being protected. So if we go back to the case in Holyoke and Candy, paragraph 8 sub 2 talks about um, what can be said is in normal circumstances, what is needed to persuade the court to grant an injunction is a threat to do an act which constitutes an invasion of a legal or equitable right. If you turn over the page to sub 8 sub 5, it describes in the case of a freezing injunction, the basis for exercising jurisdiction is different. The purpose of granting a freezing injunction is to prevent dissipation of assets, but I think can be reconciled with the proposition that an injunction can be granted under section 37 where there's a threat and invasion of the claimant's right by treating How are we assisted by a first instance decision in which, firstly, relevant authorities of this House of Lords are not cited or discussed. And secondly, um, we have subsequent authority from the Supreme Court and the Privy Council. Right. So this is a description of it. I can come back to convoy collateral in a broad idea. And I will in a moment. We haven't had the supplemental bundle delivered, have we? Yes, we have. Oh, we have? Yes. We have, OK. Tab one is broad idea. And the enforcement principle is a paragraph is described in paragraphs 84 to 89. This is obviously talking about freezing injunctions. This is a case which is concerned with what's sometimes described as the black swan jurisdiction. But this is talking about the exercise of what is section 37 and why and how it is to be exercised. The last paragraph 84 and 85 describe it. 86 uh, introduces the JSC against Abbey as of number 10. Lord Clark, I think the others have just agreed, referred to this rationale as the enforcement principle, adopting terminology which has been used in short appeal in that case. I repeat now, Jay. So the first and primary principle is the purpose of the freezing order. Stop the injunctive defendant dissipating or disposing of property, which could be the subject of enforcement. The claimant goes on to win the case it has brought. And this is repeated time after time. Freezing injunctions are to protect assets which could be the subject of enforcement. Turning over to page to paragraph 87. The relevance of the enforcement principle had the other number 10 was that it assists in determining what freezing order used by the commercial court in England. The test must be whether the assets will be available on execution of a judgment, and if they are, then they can be subject to the order, as its purpose is to aid the court's process. Now, this is a truth. Section 37 must be the purpose of aiding the court's process. Bracket, including Furthering the rights of parties or assisting the rights of parties. But if the court's process has identified how you can do that, you cannot then use Section 37 to invent a further novel means of enforcement. Particularly the nature of enforcement is against property. This is not a case of enforcing against property. This is a case of enforcing against a right or a power. Making somebody do something that triggers property that can be seized. So even if I'm, even my client is the worst person in the world, and it's just going, I'm not going to exercise this power because it will help the other side. I'm even willing to cut off my own nose to spite my friend. It doesn't mean that the claimant has some extra right. It wouldn't change if my client was a choir boy and 
hadn't been had judgment under fraud on the basis of fraud and was pre bankruptcy. If this is somebody who is not my client, who has a simple debt, but has enhanced protection, should they be forced to change their rights, to change their property, just to make it amenable to execution? The answer is Section 37 is not there to change the right of enforcement. It is there to enhance and assist the right of enforcement. And carrying on with Envoy Collateral Against the Broad Idea, paragraph 88. The enforcement principle also explains the basis and scope of the jurisdiction to grant a freezing injunction against a third party against whom no claim for substantial relief lies, i.e. non collection elections, or at least the chamber jurisdiction. The ordinary prerequisite for granting such an injunction, before taking account of discretionary factors, is that the third party is in possession of control of an asset against which a judgment could be executed. Again, execution. Not, we're going to make you do things that are going to encourage you to pay. That test may be satisfied because there's a good reason to suppose that the asset is beneficially owned by the defendant against whom the claimant has obtained or has a right to obtain a judgment. That's a chamber case. But it may also be satisfied in other ways. For example, where the defendant would have a right of indemnity against a third party which would be enforced by a receiver. And that's a classic case of receivership because a right of indemnity you can't bite on with normal execution. Appoint a receiver to call upon them. Or where a transaction by which the defendant transfers an asset to a third party might be avoided under Section 43 of the Insolvency Act. Or where the enforcement of a judgment against the defendant might lead to its liquidation, whereupon the liquidator would be able to pursue a claim against the third party. In each case, the key question is whether the assets are or would be available to satisfy a judgment through some process of enforcement. Now, the Chamber, and Lucy described the Chamber jurisdiction, is obviously wider than a standard one. It's a question of whether or not you're actually going to practically be able to get there. It's not, in that case, it's not Section 37 simply enforcing enforcement, simply assisting enforcement. It's Section 37 enforcing or assisting all the different jurisdictions, including unfair prejudice, sorry, sorry, indemnities, Section 43 of the Insolvency Act, or the like. But it's still enforcing and assisting a pre-existing right. It doesn't generate different rights. It's protecting or preserving a pre-existing right. And that's where the problem comes in this case. If you remove the arbitration... In this case, it's saying that there has to be, if you're going to have an injunction, there has to be, ultimately, enforcement of a legal or equitable right. It doesn't need to be immediate. It could be through a series of steps, e.g. Chamber. But the question in our case simply didn't arise. So it's a bit dangerous to read these as if it's addressing our issue. No, I disagree with your issue there. This case is identifying whether or not there is an existing legal or equitable right. Our case, there is no existing legal or equitable right to a lifetime allowance, excess lump sum. It just doesn't exist until the order is made. It changes property, then it exists. And that's, can you, that's the real core question of this. Can you exercise Section 37 to make somebody change their property right so that it generates property that can be enforced against them? Including appointment of receiver by way of excellent execution against property or powers that can be treated as property or things that can be treated as property in excess. We say, A, that isn't within the scope of Section 37 because Section 37 is simply to assist the ability to enforce as it currently stands. B, you can't do this because it will be changing assets. It's going to be making somebody do something that they're not obliged to do. So, 
if I have the ability to trigger certain changes to a con contract if I pay a million pounds that would generate an immediate dividend of say 500,000 pounds or 2 million pounds but if I hang on in there maybe I'll get more money later if the first instance judge is right your lordships can order me to pay the million pounds it's just an action it costs but it's just an action and that can't be right. Well, avoidance of a transaction under section 423 change, changes property rights. And um, it's quite clear that in the example which is given by Lord Liggers, that you can appoint a... Yes, because you've got the right to apply. ...to <laughs> order that someone to do something they wouldn't... No, no, no. Do. What this is doing is preventing somebody from getting rid of section. <laughs> It doesn't mean that the receiver gets to go on and take the 43. It's presented, the, the injunction is to protect both possible rights. Chapter jurisdiction doesn't make people go and take any actions. You appoint a liquidator who might take these actions. Note that. Or where a transaction by which the defendant transferred an asset to third party might be avoided. Or where enforcement of judgment against the defendant might lead to its liquidation, whereupon the liquidator would be able to pursue a claim against the third party. It's not saying that you, the section, the section 37 injunction makes these transactions happen. The section 37 injunction preserves the position so that they can happen. It doesn't make them happen. Questions from the court, um, which have slowed you up, um, but I, we better make sure we're on track. Yes. To um, your submissions by no, lunchtime or immediately afterwards. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that my submissions on ground two and three are much shorter. Yes. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to be surprised by that. Um, While I'm on broad idea, I'm going to finish off with, with these passages, which is... Well, can, can I just, just, before we leave the case and before you go on, I mean, just explain what I was saying earlier, because if you look at paragraph 52, you will see the heading, a legal or equitable right, question mark. And in the paragraphs that follow, the answer given to that question is no. And you see that most clearly, perhaps, from paragraph 56, where Lord Leggett says, apart from fees and injunctions, several further examples have already been mentioned, um, and one of which is website blocking orders, of injunctions which are not granted to protect an independently identifiable legal or equitable right or to restrain on constitutional conduct. And they go on in 57 to endorse Spry, um, and specifically so. Um, in at the end of 58. So it's all of a piece with Fourier and LaRue and Cartier, namely that the jurisdiction is unlimited, which is not to say that it can be exercised capriciously or arbitrarily, has to be exercised on principle basis, but yes. the principle basis is avoidance of injustice. Yes, but also the principle basis is an adoption of doctrines and practices that the court has, including how you enforce a judgment. There may be situations where Section 37 can be used to prevent injustice where there are not rules that impede it, and there are not principles that delineate the exercise of that power. But if there is a rule that goes against it, or if there is a principle that applies in that particular case, 
case. Section 37 is not something that can just simply go, we're going to ignore that rule. Now, I do, I do get your Lordship's point on this. Now, I, I understand what your Lordship is coming from here. There are situations where there is a question of justice which is unimpeded by other rights, etc. And Section 37 is deliberately wide in its nature. And if there's nothing else factoring into that, then yes, the court can exercise its jurisdictions in the interest of justice as it sees fit. It's going to be rare, and I have to say, in, in, in Cartier, I suspect that there was in fact a right at the end of the at the end of the chain that was of interest. But it's in principle possible. The problem in this case is that once you have a judgment. You're entitled to payment, and if the payment is not coming, you're entitled to enforce it as per the court's rule. There are reasons for the court's limitation on how you enforce it. It's developed through the centuries as a matter of legislative interest, as a matter of social development. We've got rid of debtors' prisons, we've got rid of um, a number of different remedies that were unconscionable or socially unacceptable. And we say, now you can enforce in the following ways against the following party. And that's it. I'm and sorry, I took you out of your way. You're going on to a later passage. No, that was very helpful, my lord. Um, but but even, even with that background, in broad idea, you still end up with the principle of how you exercise which ends up with the enforcement principle. Why is the enforcement principle applicable? Why is it relevant? Well, if Section 37 is simply you can do whatever you want as long as it's the interest of justice, the enforcement principle would be irrelevant. It would just be, is this in the interest of justice? The enforcement principle is relevant because if you are going to exercise Section 37 jurisdiction, and by the way, it is, it is literally Section 37, it's in the Cayman under the Cayman statute. If you're going to exercise a section 37 jurisdiction in these circumstances, it has to be to support enforcement. It can't just be <coughs> to support payment of a debt. If they could do that, they wouldn't need the enforcement principle. They could just have the payment principle. Or the judgment debt principle, call it what you will. And then you end up at paragraph 89. Where it goes on, although it's unnecessary to make the enforcement principle dependent on the identification of a legal or equitable right, and I can see that. Because by the time you've got section 37, if you have the right to enforce, section 37 can assist that. There's no harm in expressing the interest of the applicant, which a freezing injunction seeks to protect from interest, provided it is understood to be different and different in character from the right on which a cause of action for substantive relief is based. The interest protected by a freezing injunction is the usually prospective right to enforce through the court's process a judgment or order for the payment of a sum of money. Note, it says through the court's process. It's not simply saying to enforce payment of a sum of money. They could have said that. They didn't. They could have said in Tazler of, it doesn't matter if it's property, it's to enforce a judgment debt. They didn't. So it took a great deal of trouble to analyze whether this was property which was suitable for the application of section 37, in that particular case on the in, in relation to the appointment of a receiver. And the reason, by the by, for why it was so important for the appointment of a receiver was you can't can't have uh, enforcement in the normal way against a power. You can't get a third party debt order, you can't get a charging order, you can't get a writ of um, control fee file. Because a power isn't property. You can't get a charge over a, uh, over a power or a mortgage over a power. Now, I mean that, that's one way of emphasizing the distinction between a power and property. But of course, equity says, look, substance over form, if this power is capable of just, you exercise it, property drops into your hands, there you go. 
fine, we will treat it in equity as if it's property, and then we'll, we'll appoint a receiver. Once you get that, you see how that is applied. Um, I'm very briefly going to spin through Masri and Tazaruf just to show how appointment of a receiver actually operates. I said earlier that um, appointment of a receiver by way of actual execution is a misnomer. So if I jump to Masri, which is the main authority to handle tab 11, Again, this is a post-judgment case. Just to summarise, the claimant had obtained an English judgment against the Lebanese companies. It was seeking a post-judgment appointment of a receiver over revenues of an oil concession in Lebanon. It was also seeking a freezer over the rights in the oil concession, and it was also seeking some disclosure of assets. And it was held, number one, you can appoint a receiver by way of execution over foreign debts. Number two, you can appoint a receiver by way of execution future debts were not presently amenable for legal execution and, and there's lots of stuff about the Uganda Convention and jurisdiction and the like. But the useful stuff for our purposes are at paragraph starts at paragraph 52, page 471, where it describes appointment of a, a receiver by way of execution. And it explains why this is not strictly speaking execution in the ordinary sense of the word. The starting point is the effect of receivership order. Receivership by way of active execution is summarized in Snell. Right. The judgment creditor normally obtains satisfaction of his judgment by way of execution at common law using the writ of FIFA, attachment of debts, and formally in the case of land, the writ of elegance, where a charging order, etc. There were cases, however, where the creditor could not levy execution at law owing to the nature of the property principal case being where the property is merely equitable, such as an interest under a trust or an equity of redemption. Other examples were covenant of indemnity, we saw that quoted in a uh, broad idea, uh, covenant of indemnity or other shows in action in which the debt had the benefit but which could not be reached by an attachment. In order to meet this difficulty, the Court of Chancery evolved a process of execution by way of appointing a receiver of the equitable interest and, if necessary, supplemented this by way of an injunction restraining the judgment debtor from disposing of it the process was not execution in the ordinary sense of the word, but a form of equitable relief for cases where execution was not possible. The effect of such an appointment is, is that it does not create a charge on the property, but that it operates as an injunction against the judgment debtor receiving the income or dealing with the property to the prejudice of the judgment debtor. One brief nomenclature point there. Um, as it keeps on referring to execution, the modern term is enforcement. I think that there is no actual distinction in this particular case for any purposes today. We use enforcement now under CPR Part 17. I think it's a, a clear and understandable English point of enforcement being created. It goes on. Authority to bear out the proposition of in this case, the appointment does not have a proprietary effect. It has an effect in an injunction restraining the judgment debtor from receiving any part of the property which it covers. If that property is not already in its possession, but it does not vest the property in the receiver. This is what a receiver is doing. It is literally receiving the property. Now, when you appoint a receiver, you normally also make orders under 37 sub 2 as to how the receiver can deal with the property that has been appointed. So if you're appointing land and there are rents coming in, you can use the rents, for example, for management or maintenance of the property. And one of the classic things, particularly when you're post-judgment, is to say that the rents coming in can be used to pay off the judgment debt. But it's a relief, it's not strictly speaking an enforcement. And that's a provision that is made on the order. Uh, going on, as Lindy LJ said in Reese Sartoris' estate, it operates as an injunction restraining the defendant from getting in money which the receiver is appointed to receive. The judgment creditor receives no interest in the received property until it is transferred to him in satisfaction of the judgment debt. That's, we talk about this being. Technically, it is not enforcement in or execution in the technical legal sense, but it's darn close to it. And it's provided under Section 37, it's provided under CPR Part 69. But the reason that it's important to distinguish between it being enforcement and anything else is that because it's not enforcement, it falls outside Section Part 70, C 
CPR saying these are the ways you can enforce. That's it. You've also got Part 69. It's not enforcement, so we can flip through the trees. And that's all that Section 16 of Section 37 allows for. Am I right in thinking that the significance of the point in Masri was that if it was property, then making an order would be making an order out of property abroad, which the court wouldn't do, but because it was only a personal remedy over, over defendants who were subject to the jurisdiction, there wasn't that jurisdictional problem. Um, it's not quite that. It's, you wouldn't get <coughs> enforcement against the property owned overseas, um, so you'd go for a receiver. And then the question was, also you wouldn't get in, uh, enforcement against future debts because it was an oil concession that was going to pay in the future. So you couldn't get enforcement in the first place. That's why you had to go for receivership. And the, res the question in Masri was, number one, can you appoint a receiver over foreign debts? And question two, over future debts. And, and in Masri, pre-1873, you wouldn't get those future debts or foreign debts. And the answer was, well, who cares? So it's not um, that you couldn't do it because it was foreign. It was you couldn't do it because it was a future debt and a and tax. I think also a question of possible foreign. But you couldn't, you couldn't enforce normally. It's also worth, and I think your Lordship actually flagged this up in Cruise City, you only appoint a receiver where it's impracticable to execute or, or, or to enforce in the normal way. It doesn't have to be impossible, it just has to be impractical. And again, that highlights the fact that enforcement is limited in the manner in which it can be made. I'm going to jump to paragraph 56. The phrase by way of ex execution attached to receiverships orders following judgment is it has been said capable of rising to confusion. Flip over the page. Confusion of ideas has arisen from the use of equitable execution. The expression tends to error. It's often been used by judges as a curse in some orders as a short expression indicating the person who obtains the order gets the same benefit as he would have got from legal execution. If what he gets by the appointment of the receiver is not execution, but equitable relief which is granted on the grounds there is no remedy by execution of law. It is taking out of a way a hindrance which prevents execution of common law. It goes on, paragraph 57, Bow and LJ, equitable execution is not like legal execution, it's equitable relief, which the court has excused because execution of law cannot be had. Execution of law cannot be had. It's not execution, but a substitute for execution. You still have a property for execution or a substitute for it. And then Fry LJ said at 128, the appointment of a receiver was not execution, but was equitable relief granted on the circumstance, which made it right that legal difficulties should be removed out of the creditor's place. Now, I have no doubt that my learned friend will jump upon this and go, there you go, section 37 allows you to jump through and get rid of problems. Yes, as to property. You've got to have property that you can enforce against or appoint a receiver over. A, you can't enforce against non-property. It doesn't exist. You just can't do it. B, you can't appoint a receiver over something that is not property. Again, what do you receive? This is not a nomenclature issue. This is not a terminology splitting hair point. This goes to the fundamental nature of what a judgment creditor is. They are entitled to payment, and if payment is not forthcoming, they are entitled to enforcement against the property, against the asset. What they are not entitled to, what the courts do not give, what the Senior Courts Act does not give, the ability to force somebody to take action that renders available other property, that creates other property. If you have the ability to pay, and you don't, Force, you can even commit on the basis of contempt <coughs> to six weeks. But that's a punishment, not an enforcement. This goes to the nature of property rights versus the nature of a judgment creditor's rights. And as 
I said, if your lordships agree with the first instance one, it, it goes further than simply saying, oh, you get to you get to remove the enhanced protection. What the court will be saying is, you get to change what people own. You get to make them take actions that change their property. So that enforcement, which was not available before, is now available. Now, that's not protecting a legal or equitable right. It is not assisting enforcement. And even if you do not need protection of a legal or equitable right, it is not, it is contrary to the limited manner in which enforcement is available. Now I see the point my Lord Justice Arnold was making, but it's still contrary to the limited manner in which enforcement is available. Which brings it back to a scope of power issue. So if this is a private power, classic law is power can only be exercised the purpose for which it is given, properly exercised. And if it's outside that, it's outside the scope of power. Section 37 could not have been granted to the court to generate different, fresh rights. It is to assist in the execution of pre-existing rights and the enforcement of the court process. This is why we say that this is a remedy that they are not entitled to. It's a fresh remedy that they are not entitled to. So, because it's this power, which, and I, I do emphasize this again, you lose enhanced protection. It doesn't just make available the ability to grab more money. It removes the availability of tax-free cash loans. It changes what my client is entitled to before they get us looking. And that's the problem with this. If he was always entitled to call upon this, if he had a right to call for the entire pension just to be drawn down, we wouldn't have an argument on this issue. But he doesn't. Most people do. He doesn't. If all of those were available beforehand, it wouldn't be a problem. But because he, it wasn't available, he has to pay to get to that stage. He has to be made to write the book, to sing the song, to produce an album. And by the way, the reason why I'm mentioning writing a book or singing a song is uh, there is a specific reference in that to that in the case of Ex Party Gilchrist v. Armstrong, which is Authority Bundle 8. Page 531, and this is an early case. Now, the distinction between a power and property, yes, it's important, but it's more important as a distinction in equity between a power and property. Um, 531, five lines down, beginning power, halfway along, a power is an individual personal capacity of the donee of the power to do something. That it may result in property becoming vested in him is immaterial. The general nature of the power does not make it property. The power of a person to appoint an estate to himself is, in my judgment, no more his property than the power to write a book or sing a song. Now, if somebody has a contract to produce three books, and they produce two, and you just say, well, you've got to produce a third book to generate the £100,000 or whatever, you will be owed. Section 37, the first instance decision in this case is correct, could be compelled to write the book. You've got a musician, they've got a three album deal. They've done two, produced a third album, get £100,000. Again, Section 37 could be used to compel them to do this. You can't do it. It's compulsion of action. And this may be a trivial action, but in principle, it's exactly the same. Now, very quickly, I'm also going to flag up the fact that, despite the fact that a lot of this has been talking about general power. All the cases, Masri and in particular Tazara, is concerned with the power of appointment. And a power of appointment is the ability to hand over property. Uh, 
bear with me for a second where I find a bit in my notes, but essentially, this is not a power of appointment. And all the matters in Tazareth describing in which situations a power will be equated with property are a power brackets of appointment, close bracket. Because the power of appointment is handing over property, it's much easier to see it. seen the power of point description in Gilchrist, and then if you turn to Tazarup at tab 12, so Tazarup, factually speaking, was relatively simple. The claimant had obtained a judgment in Turkish court against the defendant. The defendant had gone bankrupt in Turkey, but the claimant discovered that the defendant had established a Cayman Trust but the Cayman Trust was subject to a power of revocation over the trust. So if he revoked it, all the property of the trust fund would go back into the hands of the defendant. Now there were arguments about whether or not the claimant could bring this application, and the claimant said effectively, well, whatever I do, I'll be handing it back to the trustee in bankruptcy. So those, those points disappeared. They're not relevant to what we're doing here. The real question was, could the claimant obtain an injunction appointing a receiver over the power of and you can see that it was a power of revocation if you turn to paragraph 4 of page 1724. PMSF, Tazarov, learned that Mr. Demerol had established two discretionary trusts in the Cayman Island with assets of 24 million. For practical purposes, the beneficiaries are Mr. Demerol and his wife. Mr. Demerol has power of revocation of the trust with the consequence that he could revest in himself an amount which would satisfy a very large proportion of the judgment. Now, brief point here. Power of revocation is a subset of a power of appointment. It results in property being distributed. It's not a general power of appointment because a general power of appointment allows you to give it to anybody. Power of revocation is a power of appointment that only allows you to give it to the, back to yourself, but it's still a power of appointment. And you can see that at paragraph 25. Paragraph 25, page 1727. Especially talking about the Bankruptcy Act, 1825, was enacted to enable assignees to exercise such. Sorry, I wasn't keeping up. Which paragraph? Sorry, paragraph 25. 25. Yep. The Bankruptcy Act was enacted in 1825, was enacted to enable assignees to exercise such powers for the benefit of creditors because it had been held that a bankrupt could not be compelled to exercise the power of appointment for the benefit of creditors. Right, 1825, well before 1873, Judicature Act was overtaken. A power of revocation was merely a narrow power of appointment, and the legislature had considered the context and decided that for specific contexts, property would include general powers exercised by their donor as a favour. So, power of revocation is a narrow version of power of appointment. Not a general one, but good enough. And then you go to paragraphs 33 to 34. This is what we're really doing with powers of appointment, as with all legal categories. This is paragraph 33, 34, page 1729. As with all legal categories, context was all important. There is no doubt that while for some purposes a power was not property, for other purposes the holder of a general power could be regarded as being for all practical purposes and only. Now, we say general power must be a general power of appointment. It goes on, far well power. A power, no, no power of appointment, a power is an authority reserved by or limited to a person to dispose, either wholly or partially, of real or personal property, either for his own benefit or for that of others. The word is used as a technical term and is distinct from the dominion which a man has over his own estate by virtue of ownership. Now, that's the point about a power of appointment. It's disposal of property. The power to revoke enhanced protection is clearly not a power of appointment. It doesn't dispose of property. Furthermore, it's not ancillary or antecedent of appointment or part of Take further steps. B, because 
it's not simply a step in the way of doing it. It's, as I said before, it changes the nature of the interest. It's not like the power to sell a property includes the power to sign the deed of sale. That's merely part of the power of sale. Executing a document is part of the power of sale. I fully acknowledge that. There are steps that can be taken in the power of, of appointment that are just seen as ancillary or part of it. But that's not the case here. Now, if you then with that in mind, go on to page 1731. Tax-free cash lump sum, same thing. 
goes on. In Tazara, this is paragraph 23 of the discussion, in Tazara, it's privileged chance to explain, as with all categories, context is all important. There is no doubt that while for some purposes the power is not property, for other purposes the holder of a general power could be regarded as being for all practical purposes an owner. Yes, absolutely. General power of appointment. The acute focus on the nature of the power of revocation in Tazara was designed to identify whether it could be said the debtor could be deemed an equity to own the property, which would devolve on the exercise of the power of revocation. Absolutely right. Here's where it gets wrong. Paragraph 35. Tazara held that this would be the case where the power was a completely general power of appointment. See Tazara, 33, 41, 42, 44, 53, and 45. This is the problem. In Tazara, the following features of a completely general power were identified. There was unrestricted non binding agent but unbound. Strictly speaking, the paragraphs cited give examples of cases where actually, in each case, this wasn't wasn't applicable, it wasn't a general power. But they were all powers of appointment. And the problem, the fundamental problem for the respondent, the reason that they're missing our point, is this is not a power of appointment. They are adapting an analysis of powers of appointment, ignoring the bit about appointment, and saying if you've got a power that meets all the other factors, it's akin to property without including the really crucial part about there's property coming out of it. If I had an unrestricted, non-fiduciary and unfettered power to sing a song, it would still not be property. La la la. Not property, it's a power. Um, I see that in uh, Tazaruf, at paragraph 56, the the council has set out what they say is decided by Masri, which includes at number four, on page 1734, yes. uh, development incrementally to apply old principles to new situations. Absolutely. Well, even if, even if you're right in everything you've said so far, isn't the um, development to extend to uh, revoking enhanced protection, particularly in circumstances where you're at pains to emphasize that enhanced protection is very much a minority of pensions, and that in most cases you can get the access to the money you think you buy asking for it. Couldn't that be regarded as an incremental extension? Well, insofar as any extension can be regarded as an incremental extension, but the reality is it's not an incremental extension. The you're changing the appointment of receivers from appointing receivers over property of whatever sort to, it's not really a receiver. It's just saying somebody that can go in and do things. Because a receiver, by its name and by its nature, receives property. They take possession of property. Income streams as well. And this is, if this is not property, if you are saying we are going to appoint receivers, so it's a step of principle rather than incremental. Yeah, it's, it's it's revolution rather than evolution, and it's and it's not just revolution rather than evolution in terms of what you can do with it. It's basically saying it's not actually a receiver at all. We're just going to do what what on earth we want to do. D just picking up a point you made earlier, post Freedom Day or whatever it is, um, you can choose to take a large lump sum, provided you, well not provided, you can choose to take a larger lump sum, but you incur a tax liability on doing yeah. so. Um, so a receiver could be appointed in respect of that right. If, the, right to if take, the pension scheme allows it, yes. If the pension scheme allows yes. it. Um, the actual practical effect is exactly the same as here. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, get a whopping rate tax, tax charge. In fact, same. you get more cash out, because with, with a lifetime allowance excess lump sum, it's, you can only take the lump sum of what's in excess of lump sum of lifetime allowance. With pension freedom, you can take a lump sum of everything. So the practical effect is more available. It, it, and and it, I'm straying into what comes later, but that's even though you're going to trigger the large tax liability for the pensioner. Yeah. Now, that's a. This is all about whether or not you can do it under Section 37. You then get on to the question of whether or not you should do it as an exercise of discretion. Yes. Yeah. 
so its scope it would be with if you could do it it's within the scope then it's a question should you exercise your discretion when is it reasonable this I think a rationality probably at these days uh, or assumptions issues and distinction between reasonableness versus rationality etc but yes in, in essence you could do it it's just They're not unimportant, but seeing my skeleton, I don't think it's quite clear what we say about them. I should be able to do all of them. But yes, in principle, you can do all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, this is not <laughs> what we are arguing for. It's not a fraud against China. It's not even on a public policy course of China. But if we're right about something, then the first instance decision in this case is substantially dangerous to the exercise of Section 27 jurisdiction and substantially dangerous property rights of judgment debtors, of in a perfectly good judgment debtors, let's emphasize here. Because fraudsters, yes, you've got to be cautious about whether or not they're telling the truth, whether they're hiding their assets, and Paul was jealous about forcing, forcing its, its decision carefully. But it doesn't give you any different remedy than what you've got before. I mean, the um, person who wasn't subject to a fraud debt could become bankrupt. Yes. And then they get the protection. Yes. But um, what I'm saying is that this doesn't just apply to pension debts. Because any judgment creditor could go after any judgment debtor to trigger changes to their assets, to make them available other assets, to take injunctions to make them perform actions that would trigger potentially adverse tax consequences, but would also trigger more assets. That's the point about it. It's really about the fundamental nature of Section 37 and whether the court should be allowing it. And as I come back to that point, hard cases make bad law. Now, my client uh, has repeatedly said he is not a fraud. I'm, I'm going to emphasize that, that he disputes that. He has never accepted this, and he says that the judgment came in like he was ill, and he could not properly represent himself. Your lordship. It is what it is. I can't go back five or ten years. As it turned out, set aside the judgment now. But your lordships are dealing with it. I want to emphasize he says it's not. For your purposes, it doesn't matter. But for this argument, it doesn't matter that he is or is not a fraudster because it applies to everybody. If I buy a car and don't pay the payment for the price, and I'm found guilty and liable for a judgment. And, and let me emphasize, this is all about money, money debts, which is, gets more complicated when you get into other uh, remedies. But if you've got a money debt, section uh, CPR Part 70.2 says CPR PD 70 describes the means of enforcement that are available. And 70 PD A paragraph 1.1 says this is what you're allowed to do. Third party debt order, writ of control, charging order. Income payments orders. It limits. It identifies what you are entitled to, and that's it. it I'm just going off a moment on a tangent. The um, suppose you haven't got all the pension protection. Um, so we'll suppose a situation analogous to our situation, but it, it isn't in the pension context. Yes, just because you you say we're we're looking wider than just the pension context. Um, you become bankrupt. Yep. Your estate vests in your trustee. Could it really be maintained that the trustee couldn't exercise the right similar to the enhanced protection right? Oh, okay. Um, it depends, one, I'd have to think about that. I'd have to go back and look at that power. Um, I, mean, the, 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 I mean, that's, that's really under the, the bankruptcy legislation about what powers are exercisable by trustee and bankruptcy. And I think, I suspect the answer is that if it's not a pension, then they can exercise those powers. Because the definition of property is very, is, very, is very, very, very wide, and it's deliberately wide to catch those things. In fact, as I, I mentioned, this the 1825 Bankruptcy Act was amended to include powers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but what I mean is, property. you say, well, we have to remember that uh, outside the pension context, uh, creditors can be doing all these things. Mm. Well, if the person's 
be bankrupt, they can all be done. Different, entirely different set of remedies, though. That's the point. If you're going to go bankrupt, you go bankrupt, but there's a whole different set of procedures for it. It's pari passu, it's not for one particular creditor. It's, div it's um, dismissed after three years. Three years? Three years, one year? That won't revest the property. Doesn't revest the property, but and then it's a, and then there's the question of is this a power that can be exercised under the bankruptcy provisions? But it's bankruptcy. It's not at that point. It's not enforcement. You shift away from enforcement pr provisions to bankruptcy legislatively provided for. So uh, outside of the pensions context, does this make a difference? Yes. Um, does it bankruptcy and insolvency legislation have an impact on how it makes a difference? Yes, undoubtedly. But let's think about what it does in the first place and can you make somebody insolvent are they actually insolvent before the insolvency legislation comes in i fully accept that insolvency is going to change the impact of this but that's what insolvency legislation does um and for pensions if they're not fraudulent debt they're outside of it and they're outside of it before they go into bankruptcy and that's important to the extent that this is something that I mean, at the moment we have a number of cases, there have been a series of first instance cases over the last year and a half. Uh, so your, your lordships will be aware, about two years, three years ago, they changed the provision, the practical manner in which you become bankrupt. You no longer go to the court, you go and basically sort of put a form in tick boxes and it's determined whether or not you are actually insolvent. And there have been a number of decisions coming through saying you're not insolvent because actually you've got a pension and the pension could be triggered to pay out X number of debts, particularly if you Um, so already we're seeing on, on the ground a number of cases where people are going, well, pensions are available to pay creditors who shouldn't be going bankrupt. You shouldn't, not just you are bankrupt, you can't, we're not going to let you get bankrupt to get that sort of protection. But, but that's, that's a bankruptcy issue for another day and another course. Uh, what we're talking about here, the bankruptcy is relevant. This goes to um, every judgment debtor. And it doesn't just go to power. It doesn't just go to the exercise of powers like this. It goes to whether or not you can make a judgment debtor do things that will generate assets that are amenable to execution. Because if the first instance is right, why not? Now, there may well be exercise of discretion to do it. But in principle, that's not a problem. I hate using floodgate arguments because I know that it's usually hyperbole. But if that isn't a floodgate argument for I'm going to make you do X, Y, and Z, I don't know what is. Right. It is a little more than eight minutes before the short adjournment. Um, I'll probably I'll, I will go on a little bit after the short adjournment, but not much. Um, I'm going to pause on ground one now. I'm going to say, if your lordships have any questions on it, fire away. I suspect that after lunchtime, your lordships may have further questions on it. I will probably come back and dot I's and cross T's. Uh, I'm going to very quickly deal with grounds two and three. Yeah. Right, so ground two, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is take your lordships to how this was dealt with in the judgment. This is, ground two is the public policy issue. Now, th this is essentially an aspect of exercise of discretion? It really is, yes. I was, I was going to say that that's how it works. And it's a factor that you take into account when exercising discretion. And the problem here is that having put forward all this argument about the public policy, it was pretty much dismissed as a factor. So paragraphs 53 to 54 of the judgment, which are tab 5 of the core bundle paragraphs, uh, pages 65 to 66, Paragraphs 53 to 54 sets out my arguments, basically, basically, uh, on the uh, public policy. And then you get to the conclusion, uh, page 67 of the bundle, paragraph 56, sub 2. In my view, there's no public policy which prevents the section 37 one jurisdiction from being exercised. On the contrary, the overriding public policy consideration is that 281, sub 3, expressly referred to in the 29 also should not prosper. So what we say is, it is obvious there is a public policy. 
There may well be two conflicting public policies, but it's obvious that there is a public policy that pensions should be protected from creditors on bankruptcy. And his lordship, the first instance, the judge just ignored that. And that renders it capable of being reassessed as a matter of discretion by your lordship. Now, um, I'm going to whiz through this. The references are in my skeleton, but I'm basically... You've read the skeleton, you've seen the judgment. There's not much more to add to it, but it goes like this. Before the current legislation, pension schemes almost automatically had forfeiture provisions that provided that if you went bankrupt, your pension was forfeit. And it usually provided that the pension was not just forfeit, but it would be held on trust for you and your dependents. And it was the classic protection of creditors type things that were allowed, I have to say, quite surprisingly, by modernise under the Trustee Act 1925 and so on. It, it was... It, you look at it with modern, modern eyes and you go, how on earth did anybody allow this sort of stuff? For general creditors. But for pensions, it was always, almost always done. I mean, it's in line with um, protective trust. Then. It's exactly in line with that. But it's, and it was always done with pensions. Protective trust, which now we look at and go, that cannot be pro acceptable in society. But for pensions, it was done. And then you get the good report, which identifies why that is generally, A, it identifies it's almost never to be done with pensions, and B, it says, why this is the case. And it points out that this is really about protecting future beneficiaries, spouses and dependents, and also think about who you're dealing with here. Uh, you're dealing with pensions that have been paid for with tax advantages by employers a lot of the case. And the answer is you shouldn't be making provision for old age available to creditors generally, although when it comes into payment, fine just another income stream, just another lump sum. Now, uh, the important point about that is the explanation of why it's not unfair to creditors. It's paid for by employers, as well as potentially members, with tax-deductible payments, so with tax advantages. In a sense, it's been paid for partly by the state. And the reason that it's been paid for, and this is the whole basis of British pensions, the whole base of British pensions is that they are tax advantage savings schemes which are encouraged by the state to stop everybody being poor when they retire. It's uh, what you might describe in modern economic terms as a nudge. Now in this particular case, it's worth noting that none of these, this pension derives from Mr Green's own contributions. All the contributions were made by the employer. And the reference for your Lordship's notes is Mr. A it's Allen's fourth witness statement. Allen's fourth witness statement, which is in the supplementary bundle, tab 7, paragraph 37.1, page 50. So all of the, the entire pension derives from employer contributions. So what? Because pension contributions are effectively part of the salary package. Yeah, the, the, the term you usually use is deferred, deferred, in, uh, deferred remuneration, absolutely. But it is a payment by the employer by means of remuneration on the basis the employer is paying towards mm -hmm. this and the employer is getting tax advantage and being paid for by the state. And I, there is a, I, I see your Lordship has a point, which is, so what, one person or another, it's still part of remuneration, but it's still part of, this is not money coming direct from the member, and it's also the tax advantage is being accumulated by these people from the state. And the policy is confirmed in Re Henry, uh, Henry and Horson, which is in the authorities at tab 17. Again, I, it's three minutes to one, so I won't take you to it. But uh, in particular, at paragraph 45, there is a public policy towards provision for old age. It's explained, and there is a public policy towards protection of this, which is explained by way of protection for the employer's contributions and the tax benefit due. And the rationale of this is, why give those tax benefits and those employer contributions to a creditor, and the tax benefits in particular, rationally don't make sense to creditors. And there is no difference, there's no difference in this respect for the claims of creditors arising out of dishonesty to creditors generally. Because the fraud and the saving for old age are unconnected, 
fraud and the tax advantages are unconnected. The fraud and the employer paying into the pension are unconnected. And also, because the consequence of not protecting the pension is that the burden shifts onto the state. So what you're doing here is advantaging one particular creditor at the expense of the public coffers. Why would this be a tax advantage used to assist one particular class of creditors compared to everybody else? And the answer to that is, seemingly, fraudsters are special cases. They are for in terms of enforcement, but they aren't for in terms of what they should be liable for. And to do otherwise is to impose, is A, to impose a penalty on the fraudsters beyond their basic liability. And B, for the state to fund that to the degree of the tax advantage. Now that's why, when you get the Pensions Act 1995, you start with the provision that these things shouldn't go into bankruptcy, and then that gets expanded. Not just occupational pension schemes, but also personal pension schemes under the Welfare Reform and Pensions Act 1999. But they're also saying, you shouldn't lose your pension when you go bankrupt. It's not going to go into the estate in bankruptcy. You shouldn't lose your pension when you go bankrupt. We'll take that out of out of the exclusion from forfeiture. And that's described in the green paper, authorities tab 22, as a fair and proper balance between the creditors and the principle of encouraging saving for old age. And the fair and proper balance there, and it's the highlighted passages in the green paper, is between you don't have the pension going into the estate of bankruptcy, but you can claw back excessive contributions. Now, if you can claw back excessive contributions for pension, it helps that the pension isn't forfeit. Because if it's forfeit, then you can't claw back. So that's wrapper WRPA 1990. But neither the Good Report nor the Green Paper make any distinction between creditors generally and creditors who derive from fraud or dishonesty. There is a public policy that fraudsters should not prosper from their fraud. And there is a public policy that debtors should pay their liabilities. There isn't a particular public policy that debtors should pay more if they're fraudsters than any other type of debtor. That would be a penalty clearly not mandated by any of the legislation and indeed <coughs> a penalty would have to be just on standard statutory construction points have to be expressly and clearly stated. But you can ignore the fact on this case that it's a better, uh, a fraudster. <coughs> and the reality is that we say that there is this lacuna. You're supposed to protect these things and it didn't take into account the situation of 281 and the respondents point say the public policy is set out in section 281 and we said Section 281 pre-existed, and we say it's pretty obvious that that was just no one thought about it when imposing the provisions of Pension Act 1995 and then WRPA 1999. It's not to say that you don't apply the legislation as it has been executed, but you do take account of the public policy which was behind it, even if it is an imperfect execution of that public policy. It's a relevant fact to take into account. The judge didn't. His exercise of discretion was flawed. The lordships have, have a right to reassess that exercise of discretion. But in this case, in the nature of that discretion, should not apply it in these circumstances. And is that really ground two? That's pretty much ground two. Um, in which case, we'll break there and resume at 2. 15 minutes after, after lunch? 15 minutes to cover ground three. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes, I thought for a moment you meant to.
No, no, no. Suggesting we should come back 15 minutes later. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> I will take 15 minutes after lunch. Yep, that's good. Joking. Oh, wow.